Welcome to Exploring Early Music. I'm Max Ramage, and today we're talking about historically informed performance. This refers to the idea that performers ought to imitate the instrumentation and playing style that would have been used at the time the music was written. We most often encounter historically informed performance applied to music written before 1750, but the movement has also made inroads into classical and romantic repertoires. There are two things you can do to achieve historically informed performance. One is to use period instruments instead of modern instruments. For example, modern flutes are made of metal, but Baroque flutes were wooden. Similarly, instead of performing J.S. Bach's Preludes and Fugues on piano, we can play them on harpsichord, a keyboard instrument that was far more common than the piano in Bach's day. The second aspect of historically informed performance is the use of old-fashioned techniques of singing and playing music. For instance, Baroque musicians commonly improvised ornaments that were absent from the composer's notated score. While interest in earlier musical styles goes back at least to the 1730s and the establishment of the Academy of Ancient Music in London, the historical performance movement as we know it is largely a 20th century creation. The movement was spearheaded by the French instrument maker Arnold Dolmetsch, who asserted, We can no longer allow anyone to stand between us and the composer. Historically informed performance was concerned, at least initially, with bringing to life what the composers of early music wanted and expected their works to sound like. What some concertgoers don't realize is that the very idea of historically informed performance has been subject to fierce debate. Implicit in the attempt to recreate old performing styles is the pursuit of what's been called authenticity. For example, one common goal of historically informed performance is to conform more closely to what the composer intended. Another, slightly different goal is to reproduce the listening experience of audiences of earlier times. However, critics of the historical performance movement argue that authenticity is a pipe dream. No matter how closely we copy the instrumental and vocal techniques of 17th century performers, we are not 17th century people, and therefore we cannot possibly hear the music in exactly the same way as early audiences. For one thing, we have memories of all sorts of other music in the back of our minds, and what seems old to us was modern to ancient listeners. Our societies differ from those of the Baroque or Renaissance periods, and cultural context shapes the way we respond to art. Moreover, there is always some guesswork involved in trying to recreate a past performance style. For example, it's hard to know the exact tempos that would have been used. Another criticism sometimes leveled at historically informed performance is that modern instruments are improvements on earlier ones. So why should we settle for older instruments that are presumed to be inferior? This argument asserts that composers like Bach and Vivaldi would have preferred to hear their music on the best instruments available, which for us means modern instruments. At the same time, there seem to be at least two good reasons to employ and enjoy historically informed performance. The first is aesthetic. To my ears, Baroque music sounds beautiful and interesting when played on Baroque instruments, using techniques that were current at the time the music was written. The second reason to embrace this approach as a valid performance style is that it satisfies our desire to know and understand the past. Just as we go to art museums to look at old paintings, there is ample room in concert culture for musical museums, or concerts whose goal is to display archaic performance practices for our edification. Of course, we may never be able to react to those practices in exactly the same way as the original audiences, but when art lovers go to an art museum, they can't react to 17th century paintings in the same way that 17th century viewers did. 
Yet, we still consider it educational and worthwhile to look at those paintings. Likewise, historically informed performance occupies an important educational niche in our musical ecosystem. My violin is a modern instrument, but Baroque violins were a bit different. For one thing, they used gut strings instead of metal. Also, the neck of the instrument was a bit closer to horizontal rather than tilted. The bow has also undergone a significant evolution. In fact, its curvature used to be convex rather than concave. This meant that a violin bow really looked like one you'd use in archery. I'm going to play a phrase from Bach's Double Concerto, first in a modern style, and then in a style that's considered to be more typical of Bach's time. In the modern style, I use vibrato almost continuously. Now in the Baroque style, I'm really going to cut back on the use of vibrato. Also, even though I have a modern bow, I'm going to try to imitate the distinct sound that you'd get from a Baroque bow. Limitation of the use of vibrato is perhaps the best-known aspect of historically informed performance. Many, if not most, violinists believe it is more authentic to play early music with little or no vibrato, reserving the technique for especially expressive moments. For example, the conductor Roger Norrington is known for his recordings of symphonies without vibrato. According to Norrington, Orchestral musicians did not use the technique until well into the 20th century. Most early music ensembles of the last half century restrict their use of vibrato. As a result, a clean, astringent string sound is one of the most noticeable characteristics of many recordings of early music. On the other hand, it would be an overreaction to eliminate vibrato in all situations. We have reports from 18th century musicians who complain of excessive vibrato by singers, which suggests that vibrato was common in the performance practice of that time. And in 1751, the violinist Francesco Gemignani published a famous treatise in English called The Art of Playing on the Violin. Gemignani says that vibrato, or what he calls the close shake, should be used as often as possible, on both long and short notes. While Gemignani's treatise is an outlier, his suggestion that vibrato be used at all times does contradict the idea that limited vibrato is the only correct approach to playing Baroque music. Another consideration is tuning. From the evidence of tuning forks and mechanical instruments like music boxes, it seems that Baroque pitch was generally lower than modern pitch. If the standard frequency of the pitch A in modern times is 440 Hz, the typical Baroque A was tuned to 415 or thereabouts. Yet we find great variety around that mean value, and pitch was by no means standardized in the Baroque era. Temperament or the adjustment of certain pitch intervals away from their Pythagorean ideals was also very different in the Baroque and Renaissance 
than it is today. Temperament is a rich topic for further study beyond the scope of this video. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to some aspects of historically informed performance, and I encourage you to check out the suggested readings and recordings. Happy listening! Thank you.